our first speaker is, is Anthony Smith, who is uh, the Senior VP of our Science for Arima Genomics. And I'm sure a lot of them know that uh, Arima develops tools to study 3D uh, genomics for quite some time now. Uh, Anthony, uh, it's all yours. All right. Great. Yeah, well, I'm super excited to kick off the afternoon session. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about really the culmination of research and development um, over the past few years at ARIMA, trying to wield 3D genomics as a tool um, to detect and characterize structural variants in cancer specimens. And as Jana said, I just have sort of one slide on a little bit of background about ARIMA. Um, we've been offering uh, kits and services for genome-wide analysis, as well as targeted analysis of uh, 3D chromatin organization, IC uh, being the first one. Um, if you analyze non-model organisms, we, you would know that we're very active in using HiC to assemble genomes de novo. And like I mentioned, we have uh, focused over the past few years on rather than having a genome-wide view of chromatin organization, but zooming in on individual regions, whether they're mediated by proteins or um, other sequence elements with other targeted uh, high c types of approaches. But what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit different than that, is really applying high c like I said, as a technology to detect and characterize structural variants in cancer genomes. And uh, I, I would imagine we're gonna talk quite a bit about you know, high C techniques from this point forward, also in the afternoon and also, you know, previously in the morning session, but just to sort of set up at least how I think about um, 3D genomics as a tool for uh, structural variants, I think about sort of the linear genomics approach to identify structural variants being sort of a string of A's, T's, C's, and G's. And I think about 3D genomics really um, as a way to sequence the structure of a chromosome. Uh, so rather than imaging the structure of a chromosome, can you determine the 3D structure of a chromosome through sequencing? And I think that's what uh, techniques like HiC and uh, so forth enable you to do. And so if you think about it, if you have a structural variant, some type of you know, pathogenic or autogenic structural variant of cancer, and it changes the structure of a chromosome, then a technique that can measure the structure of the chromosome would be well suited to detect that structural variation. So that's kind of the overall concept about you know, how we think about this. And really just one side out sort of our technology, at least at ARIMA, called ARIMA High C, um, just at a sort of a high level, works with a variety of different sample types, like you know, blood specimens, cell lines, frozen tissues, as well as FFPE tissues. Um, which is going to be kind of a focal point of this presentation. And if you're familiar with high c the core concept here is just taking two pieces of DNA that are spatially proximal, uh, like this blue and this, uh, sorry, light blue and uh, dark blue piece, which could be derived from very far uh, apart along the linear genome, but they're held together in three-dimensional space. And through a couple steps of cutting the DNA and ligating it back together, you can capture that three-dimensional structure information about uh, chromosomes. And, and once you extract that DNA, it goes through a conventional library prep. You can add uh, target enrichment if you want at this step, but then you ultimately sequence like on short read sequencing, for example. And then on the back end, uh, detect the SVs using uh, you know, pipelines such as the one that we offer on our, on our website and everything's open source. And, I think what's nice about this is it fits into the existing sort of NGS short read ecosystem. Um, we try to make the informatics uh, fairly easy to install and run through uh, containerized pipelines and to provide robust and reliable results. Now, I don't have a ton of time to sort of go through the conceptual build that I typically do when sort of introducing how to use 3D genomics to detect structural variants. But what I do have, I think is a nice sort of one slide, hopefully, you know, striking visual representation of how the data can be used to identify structural variants. So on the far left here is a karyotypically normal sample. 
Uh, this happens to be a uh, wimple blast sample. And if you're familiar with looking at high C heat maps, then you will know that the majority of the high C signal that you can see in this genome-wide high C heat map <clears throat> is the signal along the diagonal, which really is just sort of a, you know, sort of a observation that chromosomes uh, within the cell tend to fold and interact with themselves. Um, and so high C in this sense is really measuring the structure of individual chromosomes. And what you can appreciate from that is that lots of the signal is intrachromosomal interactions, and there's really sort of a void of interchromosomal interactions overall in karyotypically normal human cells. And in the context of a uh, uh, tumor genome, this happens to be a formalin fixed paraffin embedded colorectal tumor. You see these off diagonal sort of aberrations to the high C heat map. And if you just focus on this sort of block here, this is the chromatin interaction in space between chromosome six and chromosome four. And you see this really strong intrachromosomal like signal, but derived from two different chromosomes, which is abnormal relative to a healthy karyotype. And it's really this signal that kind of clues us in that chromosome four and six in this case have fused together. And that is a structural variant. And we can zoom in to the individual breakpoints at the gene level uh, to tell, is it a gene fusion? Is the breakpoint somewhere in the intergenic or the non-coding space to characterize that structural variant, right? So that's where they all are in this particular high C map. And I think what this is really valuable for is sort of three things. And I'll show a little bit of this in the, in the data slides to follow is it you know, en enables you to detect known oncogenic structural variants like gene fusions that are known to drive cancer, okay? and also novel fusions uh, that have not been described before. The other nice thing about this DNA-based technique uh, is because it's based on DNA, it's not based on RNA, um, that kind of helps you go back in time to analyze specimens that are well archived of 10 plus years. So we have data on that. It's not actually in this presentation, but happy to discuss uh, some of the older cases. And what's probably most exciting, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, is deploying this technology to, to find fusions that have not been detected by other technologies in a, in a clinical setting. And so let's, let's get right into it. Um, where this story all started actually was sort of a collaboration uh, with Dr. Schneiderl at NYU, where about a year and a half ago, um, there was a patient undergoing care uh, who had a recurrent glioblastoma tumor. And that had been, been resected and profiled using true state-of-the-art clinical molecular profiling technologies at NYU, which is an FDA-cleared DNA sequencing panel. It's also um, an RNA-based beam fusion panel as well as DNA methylation arrays to uh, you know, classify the brain tumor. But unfortunately, they weren't, any, they weren't able to find any uh, clinically actionable genetic driver of this recurrent advanced brain cancer. Right? The sample was then ultimately analyzed using our genome-wide high C technology. And very quickly, we were able to identify a novel structural uh, variant right around the gene called PDL1, which gets expressed on uh, uh, tumor cells to help them evade the immune system. And it's also the target of immunotherapies. Uh, so based on this, um, based on this result, we then wanted to see well, is the protein expressed on the, on the surface of these tumor cells, and in fact it was. And this is sort of an important step because this immunohistochemistry test would not have routinely been done in a pediatric brain tumor case because the diagnostic yield is so low, but because of this finding from high C, that triggered the IHC analysis. <clears throat> and ultimately what happened is the patient was put on immunotherapy some nine or 10 months ago now, I think, and still has stable disease with no tumor progression. And so this was obviously an amazing outcome for the patient, but it really set Arima, uh down the path with our collaborators of analyzing samples just like this to sort of explore the type of impact that high C technology can make when it comes to structural variant analysis um, in solid tumors. 
And so depending on who you ask or what study or what technologies are used, um, we approximate from clinical sequencing papers uh, that there is a huge number of patients that are just like this girl with advanced cancer and no detectable, actionable genetic driver, right? Hundreds of thousands of patients per year in the US across a whole variety of different tumor types. So we're thinking this is a major problem to solve. And if there's cases like this one pediatric case where we can find an actionable uh, you know, biomarker in, in other cases that this can have a really, really big impact on, um, on human health. And we think that part of the reason for the lower diagnostic yield in these papers could be, well, fish assays are single gene tests, so they're not gonna find anything. Other reasons could be nucleic acids are degraded in FFB tissues, and it makes um, things like RNA sequencing challenging and things like op optical mapping and long sequencing essentially impossible. And importantly, clinical NGS panels tend to only look at gene bodies. So any breakpoint that is outside of the gene body uh, is going to be missed. Uh, but those are really important uh, and well-known in diseases like lymphoma and other heme malignancies, um, where those, uh, what we call proximal fusions, where the breakpoint is outside of the gene body, are still very mechanistically and uh, clinically significant. And I think a poster child for, for that statement really is in lymphoma, MYC and BCL2 translate to the IGH locus, a transcriptionally active locus in B cells, but this does not produce a fusion gene, like a MYC fusion gene or BCL2 fusion gene. Oftentimes that that gene becomes activated through um, mechanisms like enhancer hijacking. Okay. That's been shown, um, I believe for, for you know, decades that that you know, translocation happens. And importantly, these types of fusions have clinical utility so if you look in the NCCM guidelines for lymphoma, testing for these proximal types of fusions is essential or um, useful in certain circumstances. And it can also stratify patient outcome in lymphoma. And people have really drilled down with really exciting work in terms of the mechanisms of this. And I, I remember last year, there was really interesting talk by Rude, Rude Delwell on EBI one rearrangements in leukemia. I think was a follow-up to this study, as well as in lymphoma from Brad, from Brad Bernstein's lab, who's gonna speak later, um, as well as other studies shown here. And importantly, um, while I think this is really well known and sort of mechanistically worked out in humans, there's sort of a, uh, at least a surge that I sense of you know, research thinking about this mechanism in solid tumors as well. I think that makes a lot of sense if you have intergenic breakpoints and you bring you know regulatory elements near oncogenes uh, that that could disrupt the regulation of that oncogene and that's been borne out in the I think in the you know PCOG studies at the level of you know thousands of tumors looking at breakpoints and gene expression levels next to those breakpoints and also individual cases like in medulloblastoma, um, ACE, uh, ACC. Fong Wei has done some excellent work in this area in terms of tools for, for the detection and validation of enhancer hijacking, as well as other studies uh, shown here. And I think they have emerging clinical utility. So really this sort of all goes to say that I think gene fusions are important, but proximal fusions are also really important. Um, and that's how we sort of analyze our data from the gene fusion plus the proximal fusion perspective. And so over the past, year and a half, we've analyzed 140 uh, patient tumors that were previously tested with conventional sequencing and had no clinically actionable genetic driver. And strikingly, in about 33% of those patients, we can find a gene fusion or a proximal fusion that implicates a gene that is the target of an FDA-approved therapy. You can see the uh, sort of you know classification here. Some of the biomarkers are diagnostic or prognostic, some of the target of drugs in clinical trial. And a lot of this data comes from sarcomas, solid hemes, CNS tumors, and colorectal tumors. And really, we see a whole range of different biomarkers 
uh, such as the one shown here, like NTREC1 uh, and like FLAG1. And I just want to leave you with maybe a couple interesting cases in the last minute of a proximal fusion here where the breakpoint is some 66 kilobases downstream of NTREC1. Uh, doesn't create a gene fusion, yet you see diffuse expression of the NTREC protein via IHC. You see the same thing in some sarcomas. Here is a, a PLAG1 where the gene is 170 kilobases away, not a gene fusion, a proximal fusion, but it activates that gene, we think. So in some 3D genomics, DNA-based workflow, you can profile FFP tissues where other methods um, don't work. It's concordant with current approaches, which I didn't have a chance to show. We think it can improve the sensitivity and the number of patients that can access certain therapies. Obviously, we have a lot of validation work to do. Um, and it, we really hope to see more cases like the pediatric brain tumor patient where they can put, get put on a therapy, respond to it from something that was found with high C that was not found with another method. Here's all our uh, collaborators here. Major shout out to Dr. Snudero at NYU, um, who's really been sort of the main collaborator on the driver negative tumors. Thank you. Thank you so uh, very much, Anthony. Uh, we, can, we can try to get a question if somebody has from, from the panel. I, I, can, I can suggest a, a quick one. So. I know that you're interested in, in single cell high C approaches. So do you think that this is the resolution is feasible? And do we even need to have single cell high C? Um, the resolution I think is going to be feasible uh, to identify st structural variants uh, from single cell high C. I've seen that firsthand myself. So I, I would say I've seen it being feasible. And I think there's a lot of really cool applications of single cell high C uh, to characterize, you know, gene regulation in various subpopulations. But what's also particularly interesting is uh, perhaps being able to track the evolution of tumors through the progressive accumulation of, you know, structural variants uh, throughout a tumor. And maybe you could do that if you could resolve different, you know, clones within a tumor uh, based on their high C profiles. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anthony.